Hello and welcome to the Space News Commercial Space Transformer series, where we aim to give you a behind the scenes look at the people and companies driving the space industry's commercial transformation. I'm Jason Rainbow, Senior Staff Writer at Space News, and today I'll be talking to Chris Mora, Vice President and General Manager for Lockheed Martin Ventures. LMV is Lockheed Martin's venture capital arm, and about a third of its portfolio is invested in space. Some of its most notable space investments include launches Rocket Lab and ABL Space. LMV also initially invested in satellite maker Terran Orbital, uh, which is now in the process of being sold to Lockheed Martin. So lots going on for an old school aerospace and defense company now investing and partnering with early stage space businesses. Thank you for joining me today to talk about Lockheed Martin Ventures and the, the space industry's commercial transformation. Great, uh, thanks for so having me, Jason. <laughs> So let's, let's start with uh, how you balance with uh, the pursuit of commercial space ventures at LMV with Lockheed Martin's traditional focus on defense and government contracts. On the surface, these two look like very different worlds, but I imagine, well, I gather there's a lot of interplay uh, there. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're as different as, as you'd imagine, right? A lot of the things that the government's interested in cro have crossed over to uh, the commercial space domain, all the earth observation things, for instance, obviously the government wants to pay attention to what's going on. So those are easy lifts for us to look at that and find the strategic interest for Lockheed. But I think a lot of the things that are going on in the commercial world are leading to what you might call the commoditization of space, right? For 50, 60 years, space has been this really interesting but government mandated domain run by large uh, government entities like NASA and other, other uh, countries as well. I think SpaceX changed a lot of that by creating inexpensive launch, which has enabled a lot of other companies to enter the space. And with those volumes, uh, companies have come out to sell the picks and shovels, if you will, to the space industry, which will speed the commoditization and continue to reduce the cost. And all those things are interesting to us and by virtue uh, to the government as well. So I, I don't think there's a big divide between what the government looks at and what we look at in terms of commercial space versus uh, uh, the defense side. Well, of course, Lockheed Martin also invests in space at the group level without LMV and recently announced plans to buy Terran Orbital, a new space small satellite manufacturer. How does the investment dynamic work between Lockheed Martin and LMV? Is there much back and forth uh, within the company on potential deals? Uh, obviously, a lot of discussion. We we made that investment in, uh, you know, 20. What was it 2017? So we, we were again uh, the early money into Terran Orbital. Uh, I think we're the only corporate investor in Terran Orbital when when we made that. And the purpose of that investment was to bring a uh, a low cost small satellite bus maker uh, to become a, a teammate partner with Lockheed Martin. And as you've seen, uh, Lockheed's run a couple of self funded missions which were very successful that we internally call Pony Express which were demonstrators that they that they ran uh, with us on that. And then uh, as a partner with us on some of the government contracts, the SDA layer uh, bids, for instance, that we won with Terran producing the buses for our, our sensor suite that, that's going up there on it. So it's been a great partnership and uh, Terran's been able to deliver effectively for us over, over the last several years. LMV isn't the only early stage investment arm of a major aerospace and defense giant, of course, Boeing, Airbus and others have them. What is competition like on that front? And do you sometimes cooperate on an investment or is it always an exclusive transaction? If you take money, you know, take an investment from NMV, then you can't bring in Boeing or, or another competitor or, or No, we don't we don't do that. I mean I know I know all the principals there and they know me obviously and we we do cooperate a lot. If you look at the cap table you see us uh, with others on a number of investments. Obviously, there's a little, maybe a little tension in doing it. I think the thing that we want to make sure doesn't happen is that um, people line out exclusivity for each other. These are small, fragile companies. If you say they can only work with you, that cuts off their market marketability and their and their revenue base potentially. Uh, I think everyone has realized that that's the case. So we're really looking at these things as as pre-competitive to from the investment standpoint. Um, I think where 
the competition may come in is when each of the companies starts to do projects with the small companies. And obviously those are, are uh, you know, proprietary things that are going on there. Uh, but from the investment standpoint, we're just looking at how do we support these companies and how do we uh, get them to the point where they could be good good partners and enter the defense industrial base in a in a meaningful way. All right. Teamwork makes space dreams work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. What, what are some of the uh, what are the key factors then that NMB considers when deciding to invest uh, in a commercial space company? Well, I think, you know, we're a little different than the average, uh, you know, Sand Hill Road VC in that we do have a strategic overlay to everything that we do. Um, all the tech that we invest in has to fit within, we're actually looking at 14 different tech domains. And these are close to the line to what Lockheed calls the 21st century uh, security domains. We've, we've talked about that. Our, our CEO, Jim Takelitz, talked about that a number of times. Uh, but that involves 14 tech domains that, you know, uh, I guess uh, luckily they overlap very clearly with the VC world at the moment. So there's a lot of interest in AI and autonomy and and uh, swarming and teaming and you know a number of technologies like that. We we also go out to quantum space tech as we've talked about, but aerospace writ large is in there. Uh, industrial 4.0 is in there. Uh, a number of tech areas that would both uh, change the face of uh, defense tech, but also uh, make it cheaper, make it more resilient, make it easier to produce. So we're looking across the whole uh, spectrum of things like that. So number one is, does it fit into those domains? Uh, are there areas that line up well with the things that we see as, as we need now, as well as the things we predict we need in the future? But the other thing we do, obviously, uh, if these companies don't survive, the tech won't be available to use. So the other thing we're going to do very much like the financial VCs is look is this business sustainable? Can it grow? Can it become profitable someday? Does it have a business model that works or, or does it have the ability to find a business model that works? So those things all come into the in the calculus of whether we make an investment or not. And, and there's so much going on, but with the, the rapid pace of innovation in the industry, how do you go mm -hmm. by ensuring that you stay ahead of the curve in identifying and uh, investing in companies that will be long-term winners? Well, one, we're very busy. <laughs> so uh, the group that that I manage, uh, we look at about 2,000 opportunities a year. So very briefly, you know, we're, you know, we say no 99% of the time. So invest in in 1% of those opportunities. So we're doing on the order of 15 to 20 new investments a year, but we do screen through, you know, about 100 investments, 100 opportunities for every one that, that we do take. So we're trying to look for the cream of the cream uh, in what we do. Again, we look first for that strategic alignment, but we also look for that that bluebird, that thing that we never thought of that doesn't show up in a roadmap, something really unique uh, that maybe could fit a future need. So in that way, we're trying to stand in front of the company in terms of long-term strategy. That's the beauty of venture, right? These folks uh, that we work with, the entrepreneurs are are looking five to seven years out, whereas most corporations are looking at three to five years out. So we've got a little bit of edge in terms of what smart people are looking at uh, a couple of years ahead of where most corporations are planning. And so we we try to uh, trade on that as well and bring those opportunities into the company to look at as well. What, what role do you see for partnerships between traditional aerospace companies and emerging space players in general. And how do you navigate those? Because it can't be easy for a legacy space company to work with a nimble upstart that is perhaps not used to all the, or not so used to all the red tape that can bog down space projects. Yeah, I think I think both sides have things to learn, right? The the government is a, is a difficult character, right? Lots of rules and regulations. Sometimes a small company doesn't know that. We help them navigate that. And then we obviously can learn on how to be nimble. Um, you know, decades and decades of things have happened in space. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, institutional knowledge. You know, we can bring that to the table as well. But we also learned that some of these startups have actually figured out how to do things maybe differently than we know how to do. And in fact, Terran Orbital has has created a lot of automation around certain uh, build cycles that I think we can benefit from, even on satellites that we make one of. Um, they've been able to automate things that that normally no one would have imagined could be automated. So I think there are things that we can learn from both both sides in this. And that's where we try to find the, the relationships that we create with these small companies. 
you mentioned AI and, and quantum technology earlier. What are some emerging technologies that you're particularly excited about, which have the potential perhaps to disrupt the, the current market landscape? Well, AI, you know, there's a lot of, there's so much uh, focus on AI right now. I, I hate to say it, but there, I think there's a lot of AI snake oil too. You know, companies are renaming themselves AI. And when you look under the hood, there's not much differentiating on there. Um, the things that are, are really getting us on, on AI right now is, is cooperative teaming and swarming, you know, a, a little bit of an extension of AI techniques that are used for uh, recommendation engines and things like that, or large language models and things like that. So we're, we're kind of looking at very specific use cases in the defense domain for AI. Uh, and we're not really looking at the things that are large language models and just generic AI problem solving. So we're trying to look beyond that. And in terms of quantum, uh, you know, we've, we've done several investments in the, on the compute side. Um, we're looking now in terms of sensors and other phenomenology, quantum phenomenology that may not be classical quantum to the way people think about, but quantum effects of materials and things like that. So quantum is actually a, a fairly big domain that stretches across compute to uh, materials. And so we're looking at all those things as well. These are just cool capabilities. He, oh, says, without, he, he says without skin in the game. Um, but well, actually, things at a distance are always cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually, um, but how do you see the intersection of commercial satellite developments and the growing trend towards space sustainability, particularly in areas like uh, debris mitigation and satellite end of life management, which does affect us all? Yeah, that that's a that's a tough question. I mean, it, people have been asking that for a decade at least. Right now, I think that the challenge there, right now, is that there's a lack of monetization of that problem. Right? We know it's a problem. We see it's a problem. We see technology that can solve the problem, but nobody's willing to pay for it. So if the governments or or you know some international agency creates a way to monetize it, you're going to get a lot more activity in that space right now. So there are a few demonstrator projects out there. I think some people have used some nets and things to snag some debris and so on and so forth. But if you want wholesale uh, cleanup to go on, then it's going to have to be a, a much more incentivized uh, activity, let's say. I mean, it, it, if you clean up a slot, an orbital slot, do you get that slot, for instance? Um, and how are you going to police that if somebody does something bad in that slot and so on and so forth? So I think... Uh, those things haven't happened yet to the degree that they need to, to really stimulate venture money investment in the space. Uh, but like I said, the tech uh, capabilities are there. I mean, we've seen some demonstrations already, but to scale that wholesale, there really has to be a, a market created, right? A business created behind that, I think, to to really get more money and more companies to lean in on that. Do you, do you see that happening now? Are there, you know, the foundations being laid out? How, how far away are we from, from this, do you think? I, you know, I'm not that close to that, but I, I think it's really going to come down to regulations and orbital slot assignments and things like that. If, uh, if they're related to your ability to clean it up, I mean, like a, a geo slot with a, with a non-functioning satellite in it, if it's over a landmass could be worth, you know, a billion dollars of revenue a year. So why, why wouldn't you want to replace that satellite with something useful? Why wouldn't you want to achieve that? Uh, Leo, it's probably a, a lot less involved with that, but obviously we have to get through Leo to get outside of that. So the value of cleaning up Leo may be more than Geo from from a use case standpoint, but not from a revenue standpoint. So I, I think there are a lot of things that have to be thought through and, and reasoned through before these models can be created. But I think that's an impediment to whole scale cleanup of of the orbital infrastructure. Thank you so much. Very interesting. There's, there's clearly a lot of optimism in the industry at the moment, but to wrap this up, let's, let's take a step back. And could you maybe outline some of the main challenges and major risk factors space investors should be worried about? What, what keeps you up at night? 
Well, I mean, space is a world of uh, tremendous visionaries, right? Everyone's got a, a big idea that they want to do. And, you know, honestly, the, the technology seems to play out. We've been impressed more times than not that the big visions from a technical standpoint work. Uh, they're able to do what they say they're they're doing. The problem is the business model doesn't work. So, yes, I've done this amazing thing, but nobody's willing to pay for it or they're not willing to pay enough for it. And the cost of doing it was pretty high. So that that seems to be the challenge, finding uh, the combination of a, of a big idea that people want to pay for. And that's not you know, that's not unique to space. But I think space has a lot more visionaries than other areas that we look at. So that that is the biggest challenge and truly investable opportunities in space are hard to come by. These large constellations, for instance, you know, very expensive to build. Uh, you need to acquire lots of customers very quickly. They need to pay uh, a good amount of money. And then these constellations need maintenance and service and, and reconstituting. I mean, it, it's not cheap uh, to run something like that. So your business has to appear pretty rapidly uh, or you have to rely pretty heavily on your investors for a long period of time and, and hope that the end game plays out for you. So I think that that's the challenge that I see a lot is that great ideas, but the, the business foundation not not quite there. Great. Chris, thank you so much. It's a great place to end it. No problem. Uh, thank you. Appreciate the yeah. time.